pitching discussion for the next hour. We'll go up until noon, and then we'll take a break. Thanks for being here. I'm Steve Berthium from the Diamondbacks. Uh, about to start my seventh season broadcasting D-backs baseball with Bob Brenly on Fox Sports Arizona. Looking forward to another season getting underway in uh, just under three weeks from now. We've got a terrific panel for our discussion about how the evolution of innings demands is changing how pitchers train, training methods, technologies, and so forth. We've got a great panel here, and I'll let them introduce themselves, starting down the end with Scott Radinsky. Hey, Scott Radinsky. Uh former pitcher, uh, I guess I could consider myself a current coach, even though I'm unemployed. Uh, <laughs> really looking forward to this. Uh, I've been excited so far from what I've heard, and um, kind of anxious to see what these guys have to offer here, and uh, anxious in uh, listening and learning, and thanks for having me. Great. Seth Daniels with Rapsodo, uh, Director of Sales and Product Development for them. Uh, primarily on the sales side, focus on the MLB teams uh, that we are uh, currently running through uh, for the 2019 season. Uh, and then also lucky enough to be the first uh, employee for Rapsodo over here in the state. So I've kind of been here from uh, start to where we are now. Great. Stephen Kedavid, uh, Kinetrax, and I'm the president and founder of the company. I primarily work on the software development of our marketless motion capture system, and we do uh, pitcher and hitter tracking. Uh, Eno Saris, a baseball writer for The Athletic, formerly of Fangraphs. Woohoo. Scott, let's start with you because you're a boots on the ground guy, so to speak. More than a decade as a major league pitcher, more than two decades as a, as a coach. How have innings demands and the evolution of the pitcher, what we expect for them, how has that changed over the course of your playing and coaching career now in terms of how pitchers prepare themselves? I think it's the, the demands obviously lessened. Uh, the structure of, of pitching staffs have um, you know, the demands on a starter aren't as great as they were. Um, as far as how it's changed, uh, the the training I think uh, it's more specific now, uh, specific to your certain role, specific to uh, what they what they ask of you, what what you're asked to do. Um, I wouldn't say it's easier, but uh, I mean, if you were to ask somebody like Sandy Koufax, I'm sure he would say that it, it, it's a lot easier now for, for a pitcher to go out and throw 150 innings than it was 250. Um, and I might be lost in your question. Um, but it has changed to a degree where, where uh, it is lessened. Uh, like, I, like I mentioned, the, the expectations aren't as great, but the roles have changed, and, and I think it's allowed other pitchers on, on the staff to, uh, to increase their innings. So if you tell a guy, look, we're not worried about 200 innings anymore, just give us 175, 150, we'll be happy. How does that actually, how does that change actually manifest itself in what that pitcher is doing day to day? Well, I think that as far as strength and conditioning. In regard to anything. I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm not really sure. Um, I think every, everyone's individual. They're all different. They're all in a different program. They're all a different plan. Um, I, I don't know if a pitcher wants to have a certain number thrown in front of them and, and say, this is what your limit's going to be. Um, you, you know, you, you take the ball, you get through the lineup, and, and you try to get through it again. Um, we're seeing now that the third time is a little more damaged, so uh, try to get through as much as you can with, with, with less damage. Um, but I don't think you should put a number on – I don't think you should put a specific number – at the forefront of a season and say, this is, this is what you have. You know, this is your goal. You know, I see you in clubhouses all the time talking to pitchers. Your stuff is tremendous and fan graphs and the athletic and ESPN.com, MLB.com. You read it everywhere. How do you think the mindset of these pitchers has changed since you've been in big league clubhouses in terms of preparing themselves and their workload over the course of the season? I think of it almost as um, the uh, postseason dedication of the regular season. Uh, because in the postseason, you always see the starters throwing closer to their max. They get a little bit of a velo bump. They're just trying to get through four or five innings. Um, and we, we saw that first in the postseason. Now we see that in the regular season. Um, and the way that I think it, you know, it really plays out is that sort of pitching as hard as you can. 
you know, I'm just gonna just get through this inning and the next inning and the next inning, and I'm gonna throw as, as basically as hard as I can. Um, and I think it's been, you know, part of the injury increase um, and, uh, and part of uh, the way we're trying to figure out new roles for people where we might have openers and, I mean, I don't think we can call them middlers, but... Um, you may have started something right there. I think uh, that, yeah, this, this guy, he's a middler. Really. <laughs> Give him the fifth inning. But uh, maybe like a stabilizer and a yeoman for like, you know, the, the, the guys who start after the opener. I don't know. But we're, 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 I think we're in, the, we're in flux right now. And I think, um, yeah, I think if you, if you don't exactly know where you're going to end up when you get to the major leagues, you kind of just throw as hard as you can and get everybody out as, you know, just go inning to inning. How are guys reacting, the guys that you talk to in big league clubhouses, reacting to the fact that things are kind of in flux right now? The, the ground underneath some guys is a little more uncertain these days. Yeah, a, a lot of them hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Why yeah. is that? Um, what do they hate about it, I guess? Well, certainly a veteran who has an established pattern of getting ready for a game, uh, you know, just what they do uh, to get ready, um, they don't want that disturbed uh, they're, they're creatures of habit that uh, will even wear the same underwear or whatever it is. Um, so having an opener in front of it just sort of throws it all off. I, mean, I remember talking to Brandon McCarthy before he went into the front office for the Rangers, and he said, uh, fine, do it with the kids, bring it up with the kids, but don't do it to me because I'll be screwed. Um, and uh, so, I, I, you know, and that sounds like something where you're just like, oh, I don't care, you can do it, go out there and do it, you know, you big baby. But, uh, you know, being in the right frame, frame of mind is, is a big deal. Being comfortable is a big deal. So I think the best teams that will have the most success with it will make sure everyone's comfortable. Uh, you saw the Rays did it. They're a very young team, you know, and they, those, all those guys came up together. Mm -hmm. And so they were just like, we're doing this. We're going to do it. Like when the Pirates did shifting, they were like, you know, we did a ton of shifting in the minor leagues before we really ramped it up in the major leagues. Um, and then the other teams that sort of tried to copycat, you heard some, you heard some gripes in the media. Seth, you guys have more and more players and pitchers, I should say, coming to you at Rapsodo, and they're more inquisitive about what they're doing. How can I get better? Do you find that the younger guys are a little more open to the way the role of pitcher is evolving than some of the veterans? Sure, and I think, too, one of the interesting perspectives that we get is that we are purely a player development tool. Uh, it's not used in in-game, so when we talk about how our guys training differently, uh, it's primarily you know, our, our sort of tool and that, that environment that we get experience in. And then also primarily from the last you know, two to three years and then really this time uh, from a 2019 season standpoint, uh, our sort of prevalence in the league. So that's where it started to ramp up. We don't have a lot of you know, statistical data to go back on from a Rap Soto standpoint to say, mm -hmm. here's how guys train and here's what that looked like. Um, it is a little ironic that from a training standpoint, a lot of that's done when, they're, when guys are not with the team, uh, right? Because when they show up for spring training, it's couple weeks and we're gearing up and ramping to go. So we do get a lot of that, um, you know, the individual players seeking us out uh, from what that looks like uh, and doing it at facilities, you know, driveline, et cetera, like we mentioned earlier, um, the, there was on the earlier panel, where they can go and find this sort of data and training tools that can help them out with that. We have our own facility. The guys will come and seek uh, our information. Guys don't want to just get the product uh, to be able to use it. They want to know how to use it. Uh, when they throw on it, there's a lot of questions. And guys will come in and just spend you know, a couple days with us uh, going over their numbers, what this looks like. Uh, and our whole goal is just kind of educate them. And that's former all-stars that are trying to make a resurrecting part of their career back in, uh, you know, the Craig Breslow story that, that happened that was one of our sort of first pushes or initiatives into MLB, uh, in, into the younger guys who now see this as a tool to get them from point A to point B. Uh, and they're maybe a little bit more uh, inquisitive and easier to get on board uh, than a lot of the older, more established players. And some guys, uh, you know, I think understand the writing of this is a tool that's going to help me get better and help me further my career, maybe another year, or whatever that may be, and that's really valuable. Steven, what about Kinetrax? Do you find that more and more players are interested in the technology? How can this make me better, where maybe a few years ago they were a little more closed-minded about it? Yeah, I think uh, having biomechanical data is what we do, essentially tracking the biomechanics and the movements of the pitcher and the hitter in the game gives them you know, the, the players an ability to be able to look at what they're postures look like within the game over time. Uh, there are ways to be able to monitor for fatigue, uh, stress on, for example, the ulnar collateral ligament, 
uh, and using the skeletal information, I think players can kind of look at that data after the game and then be able to uh, compare it to their baseline performance and then determine whether or not uh, there's some differences there. Or if they didn't feel com completely comfortable during the game, they can identify that by panning around in the 3D environment and, and look at those, uh, compare side by side their, their movements in a, in, a, in a game that they felt great versus where they didn't feel maybe as great. So I think from that perspective, the biomechanical data can, can help. Scott, I know you've been monitoring TrackMan for the Angels the last few years. Do you, have you found in recent seasons there's more and more technology, more devices, sort of this electronic invasion as a pitching coach? Oh, there's a ton of it. Um, and, you know, the last four or five years, it's really kind of slammed on us. Um, and and as, as he mentioned, guys are going out and resourcing their own individual places. And... and it's, it's tough to, to, to keep up to speed with it all. Um, you know, and every organization is different. Uh, what they, what they want to use is different. How they want to distribute it is different. Um, but it certainly helped, you know, from a coaching perspective, um, from what little bit I've been trying to gravitate to and learn and, 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 and understand. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it just makes things easier. It gives you a, uh, we were talking about this last night, I mean, you know, it, it gives you an opportunity to be right. It gives you an opportunity to make a, a, a calculated decision and, and, and give some information that's accurate. And it's not just uh, me looking at a video or, or saying, this is what I think. It's proof. And if you can communicate and if you can establish that, 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 that relationship, it's, it's easy to, to be able to translate the information to even the stubborn the stubborn guy who, who hasn't bought in, um, as I heard earlier mentioned, everybody goes bad. And when they go bad, it's, they're vulnerable. And it's easy to, and you don't have to cram it down their throat, but you have it and you slowly instrument it, and, you, know, you, you, you infuse it into their, into their game and you, and you get them thinking. And, and if it, you're hitting them with quantifiable numbers, like, look, this is hard data, this is fact, it probably is easier to sell it to them, right? It makes it a lot easier. A lot, yeah. you know, you're, like I said, it's it's proof. It's it's accurate proof, and and um, it makes you right, and and, and kind of helps them believe in you a little more down the road when you might be throwing something out there that's just guesswork. Uh, I want to remind everybody: if you have questions for our panel, you can uh, write them down in the back at the corner of the room there. And about 20, 30 minutes to go, we'll get to everybody's <coughs> questions. So we encourage you: if you have a question for any of our panelists, please write them down, and we'll get them going over the course of the next hour. Uh, Seth, I, as a Diamondback broadcaster, I'm interested in what Luke Weaver is doing, and I know there was a, a terrific piece in The Athletic by Zach Buchanan not too long ago about what Luke did. He went and he wanted his own rap soto, bought it, and he's using it on his own, right? You were talking about that earlier. Yeah, there's a, a number of individual players to the point that that wasn't necessarily a push of ours uh, initially. Uh, we didn't necessarily sought out um, you know, individuals to go after from a sales push, but it makes sense that that would be uh, a push uh, that we would get kind of internally. So we've, we've been to the hiring people to be able to kind of manage uh, the individual players who have come. That's hitters, pitchers, et cetera, who want to use this tool in the off season. Uh, and we have individual case studies too that, you know, we don't necessarily document them all, but you can see from one season to the next, a guy slider, um, and then he picks up a tool uh, or uses it, you know, with great coaching. They help develop a new pitch uh, and a new tool. And it's sort of, you know, we call it just building the arsenal from a pitch design standpoint how they can either take a picture they already have and then kind of use pitch design to sort of craft that uh, and then make that as good as possible pitch as their you know bodies will allow they're not making up you know 5,000 rpms that just didn't happen you don't all of a sudden just pick up that sort of uh, velocity increase you can do that but at a certain level there's going to be kind of peaks so how do you use the tools that you've been given uh, in, in order to make that uh, as valuable as possible and so using you know, the, the cameras and the technology that we have to be able to then craft pitches and to say this is, you know, you can use that from a, a benchmark standpoint of other people. I want to I want to pitch like uh, like that guy. No, it's not going to be a one-to-one -one match because there's a lot of different uh, things that go into that with levers and how the guy throws the ball. However, you can say here's the pitch profile that I want to uh, establish and here's how I want to attack hitters with it and then build up set of pitches off of that as well. So you have pitchers going to your facility and after a while they were showing up saying, hey, can I buy my own? Yeah, very much so, yeah. And then uh, you'll see them, even from a free agency standpoint, I had a team that uh, came up to me when I was meeting with them in spring saying, you know, we had a guy uh, who purchased from you um, and he 
loves your product and he used it in the off season and before he signed with us he wanted to make sure that they you know the our tool is something that you guys used um, because he wanted to continue that um, sort of product development. That was sort of the first time we've heard of that. We've heard a lot from a scouting standpoint um, that, you know, the schools, high schools, colleges, et cetera, are using this data and then teams are finding out, uh, you know, more about players than they ever had before. Um, you know, not just the one-off showcases where a guy threw a couple innings, which I think is valuable because you get to see live on live, good on good. Um, but you also get, you know, years of data and they can now come out of this, which is exciting. Eno, do you find more guys have these kinds of gadgets and other gadgets in their uh, lockers? Oh, yeah, for sure. And, you know, now that you – I think this is a big uh, difference from last year. Uh, now every team basically has Rapsodo or you know, the smaller Trackman unit uh, behind uh, the bullpens. Uh, so, you're, like, they're, they're used to they're, – they're throwing to the machines all the time uh, and hitting in front of the machines. Uh, you know, one thing that I think that uh, is still important, though, is that human element because of, like what you were saying, where it's not, it's not really, we're not at the level where it's a prescriptive exactly. I mean, sure. it's, I've seen some plans for pitchers where even, even those plans have to have some give in them. Like, we're going to try and, you know, shape it this way, um, and we're going to see if you can do it. We're going to go through, and the, and the human beings can be the ones who be like, try this cue, try this cue, think this way. Um, and, you know, what Scott was talking about being right, uh, I think it's also really important to be wrong uh, or to admit you're wrong to, to sort of build that trust up. Um, I, I know like Jeff Samarja and I um, have, have, create, have this bond now uh, and he hates nerds. <laughs> well, he, he, there's been some comments. But he, he said uh, to me, you nerds, go get me the best team and then leave us alone. Um, uh, but so he's really open-minded about he's it. He's really open-minded. <laughs> and yet I was like, so why do you talk to me? Like I'm a nerd. And he goes, well, you've admitted you're wrong in the past, and you seem like you listen. So listening, uh, establishing that bond, and then allowing, like, I think our precision right now, we're not necessarily precise like this. There's a band around everything we know. Uh, and if you sort of operate within that band and listen to the person, you, you, even what you were talking about, feel, is huge. So, you know, we're not telling them that your, your arms have to do exactly this, but if you felt good in that other game, let's let's try to make your arms move like that game as opposed to being like, you know, this is the machine we want to make. Yeah, well, Steve, what about at Kinetrax when you've got the, the markerless motion capture system that you guys use, how do you present that and also leave room for the human element that Eno was mentioning? You don't want to turn everybody into a robot. Right, exactly. I mean, there are ways that you can present the data that is uh, more amenable to the coaching staff, to players, uh, like I mentioned, you, you can put up the skeleton side by side, and essentially this was a, a good pitch versus a bad pitch. You can align the two, look at them in the red and blue, and determine what, what were the differences in, in the mechanics there. Then you can essentially go back and try to tweak uh, your, your performance to be able to get it closer to you know, what feels good or what your, your, your peak performance was. But you know, the, the clubs we're working with is whether they – you know, know it yet or not, they're probably the largest uh, motion capture collectors of, of data in the world because, you know, with marker-based mocap, you basically have to affix these markers onto the subject, and that's a tedious project, uh, process. It takes half hour to do. Here you can run and get thousands and thousands of data points, collect prospective versus retrospective data, pro uh, post-injury versus pre-injury, and then you can actually look at what the differences are and what took place at a particular point where the injury took place within, within a game. So uh, massive amount of data that you can really uh, make use of. How does all the data, you mentioned injuries, how does it help or does it in any way hinder injury? I mean, how, how do we prevent injuries, I guess is what I'm trying to ask you. How do we use all this data, all this technology, and help guys stay healthy? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a you know, work in progress. I mean, data only gives you one aspect of, of that and being able to solve that issue. But, you know, you can look at things like varus valgus torque, the, the moments at the elbow, for example, and do the, the kinetic analysis using something like a, a, a Kinetrax system um, to determine what the stress is on the elbow. And uh, you can also build classifiers, for example, if you have a large... Uh, prospective data set post-injury and pre-injury you can build classifiers you have myriad of different biomechanical variables you can extract from that data 
and you can do like factor analysis and determine, you know, variable X, Y, and Z were most indicative of potential injury in the future. So there's the potential there. Uh, I'll make this a little bit Diamondback specific in terms of pitchers deciding what pitches to throw. I know a couple of years ago, Robbie Ray had sort of finally given up on his changeup, went to a curveball, won 15 games, had a terrific year. Patrick Corbin gave up on his changeup, threw a slider and a curveball, ended up with a $140 million contract. In, in terms of the data, when you get it all, do you find, Seth, that guys say, wow, I should stop throwing that pitch. I should throw something else. In terms of training the pitchers, are we altering what they're doing out there on the mound? Sure, and I think that's a big push for us is not just um, collecting the data but then also being able to actually look back at it and understand movement profiles. Um, so a big point for us is understanding what sort of movement pattern are we creating and if we have pitches that overlay on top of each other, um, those need to be carefully looked at to say uh, is there a big velocity displacement between them uh, or are we really throwing the same pitch uh, out of a similar arm slot, similar speed, similar rotation, et cetera, that's going to have a similar movement pattern and ultimately, um, you know, not have enough differentiation uh, to kind of segment that into a new pitch from a hitter's point of view. Uh, and I think that's a big point for us to be able to kind of help pitchers build their arsenal and say how do pitches work off of each other. Uh, and it's that's not new, right? Pitchers have been doing, you know, you have a set of pitches, uh, you pitch certain pitches in account. None of that's necessarily new, uh, but I think if we can, again, help them use whatever sort of, uh, tools they have to be able to build their best uh, possible arsenal uh, into that it can be effective. Scott, do guys listen to their coaches when it, you're talking about pitch selection and repertoire arsenals? Um, they do uh, to, an, to an extent. Uh, I think when you're out there on the mound in the, in the heat of the battle, you're going to go with your instincts and your gut and, and, and the feel at that time. But I think the suggested information um, distribution is is – is key, you know, in spring training, you can walk around and you have the, you know, the data from the from the previous year and and uh, you know the suggested percentage of breaking ball to fastball or or vice versa, and and the zones of where your pitches play off the best and um, you know I I was listening to the sequencing, which is interesting. Um, you know, when do we get into that point where we can lay out three four pitches in a row to a to, you know a certain batter? But uh, they do listen, and, and they're interested. And, and like you mentioned earlier, some guys went, wow, you know, I, I shouldn't be throwing that. And, and, and they realize well, my breaking ball is a lot better than I thought it was. And this proof sometimes help you, helps you believe in, in executing that pitch. You know, Seth was talking earlier about guys coming up to him <clears> and say, I, I want to throw a slider like that guy, or I, I wish I had that guy's change up. Does that still take place in the clubhouses where you go? Do guys, pitchers are watching other guys' stuff and saying, how do I learn to throw that? Yeah, there's a really high profile uh, thing that just happened last year with Trevor Bauer where he was looking at Corey Kluber's slider. And he just went, went home and studied and uh, worked with his machines at driveline and just uh, tried to replicate uh, Corey Kluber's slider. And he came back last year and, and had great success with it. Um, you know, the one thing is, though, that, like, you really have to mirror, like, you have to be have about the same release point, be, like, the same kind of guy in terms of size, even. So there's a model, yes, sort of being within those parameters of think, physically being think able he, to do it? He did that work. I hope that everyone does that work because, uh, you know, depending on where your slot is, uh, and even your release mechanics, how far out in front you are, even uh, just actually just how your body is shaped. Uh, and I don't know if time did this, but I remember I was here on a panel one time, and Dallas Braden was sitting next to me, and his hand was like this pretty much. And he'd, he'd pronated so hard on that screwed ball that he always He was noticed. deformed. <laughs> yes. Uh, and just recently talked to Sonny Gray, and he was showing me. He's like, when I throw my fastball, I, it comes out like this. And I really, I can't, it, I really have to think about it to get it to here. Uh, my body is just, a, I'm a breaking ball pitcher. This is how my hand is. Um, so, you know, you don't know if that's because he's been doing it for so long, he's deformed himself, uh, or uh, if there was something natural he started with. So, some people, like, you know, some people can't learn this guy's change. They'd be like, oh, I'd love to have that guy's change. Well, uh, I don't think it's going to happen for you. You mentioned Sonny Gray. He wrote a terrific piece. If you haven't uh, read it yet, I encourage everyone here to read Eno's piece about Sonny Gray and the Athletic. Tell us a little bit about that, how that story of Sonny Gray came to be with you and with him and how that whole thing worked? Because now he's discovered he needs to do things differently. I think actually Sonny Gray is kind of the story of, of the modern ball player right now. And what you were talking about with the struggle, you can, you can 
you have a moment there to talk to them. Um, I think that if Sonny Gray was back on the Yankees again, I think he would probably be a better pitcher this year. Uh, Why is that? Because, you know, the first time, um, I, I won't use the full, cu all the cuss words, there's a lot of cussing. Uh, it's baseball. It's, it's baseball. <laughs> uh, but the first time I met, I, I walked up to Sonny Gray, he was like, your poop is not good. Your, your shit is no good. And I'm like, what? And he's like, analytics, numbers, all that stuff, and the grip stuff you do, grips don't matter. And I'm like, really, grips don't matter? And he said, yeah, yeah, I just go up there, and I'm, I'm on the mound, and I just, you know, fiddle around, and I throw some 94 heat. And, uh, and, he, and that worked for him for a while, because he has excellent stuff, and he was a young man uh, on top of the game. But once he struggled, um, you know, he reached out to me and asked about spin rate. Well, oh, now he wants help all of a sudden. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, and now he just spent the offseason throwing in front of the machines at Vandy. Um, and they've got a, a great sports science lab down there. And um, he was throwing in front of his college coach, Derek Johnson, who has left Vanderbilt to be the Milwaukee Brewers pitching coach and is now his pitching coach of the Reds. And in front of uh, a friend of his, Caleb Cotham, who's, who's worked at Driveline since. And he, he was throwing in front of friends. They were comfortable. And he had that moment where he was, he was vulnerable. And he's like, I need to something's wrong, let's, let's figure out what went wrong. And so he went through and he, they, they talked about spin efficiency. He has a high spin four seam, but it's not Verlander's, you know, zippy thing. It's, uh, it's more of a, a kind of a cut fastball. So he, he's like, My, I only get 40% spin efficiency on that. So then it gave him, it almost gamifies it a little bit where he's like, well, let me try and get 90, you know? Uh, and he tried different cues and he could get 90 every once in a while, but maybe it doesn't work out. Maybe he can't do it three out of three times. Uh, so instead, they also try to figure out what's their strengths. You can throw to a rep, so you can find out your weaknesses, but you can also be like, this is your best pitch, and this is your best pitch, and this pitch here is your best pitch. Do those things. Seth and Steve, it's interesting. You know, just said, emphasize the point I think you were making earlier. There, there comes a time in a pitcher's career where maybe he's at a low point, and suddenly he's a little more open-minded about things that he ignored earlier. Do you guys find that to be the case when they sort of reach – the bottom there, they're willing to climb back up using some more tools that they were not open to earlier? <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I think, too, different players come at different times. Some actively seek it out, and that can still be, you know, perennial all-stars that are actively seeking out that were some of the first people to purchase Rap Soto by themselves. Uh, and then there's other guys who come to us in a little bit more of a, I'm going to be out of the league if I don't change something. Uh, and at that point in time, then it's, you know, they're, they're willing to really hear and listen to what you have. So there's a little bit of occasionally a sense of desperation. Sure, sure. And I guess at that point, uh, if everyone is a little bit desperate when they're training, then you know, it kind of can yield to some good results, so that's good. Steve, do you find that to be the case? Yeah, I mean, I don't, we don't speak much with the, the players directly, but the, you know, having data over time, uh, you can kind of look back at your, 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 your prime years and determine maybe what what our differences are in the mechanics at that time. So uh, try, try to emulate that or go back to that a certain, to a certain extent. So I think that would be useful. Scott, what about you? Every pitcher over the course of their career has ups and downs. Uh, how are, have things changed for you versus when you were a pitcher versus when you were a pitching coach? Uh, I, I didn't know any better. Um, you know, uh, we get the ball and throw it as hard as you can. Uh, throw it down the middle. Um, and you could throw pretty hard. I guess that's the mentality now, is just throw the ball as hard as you can. Um, um, you, you become stubborn. Um, you, you just, you don't want to evolve. You don't want to believe that my stuff's a little short and I need to make an adjustment. I need to make the change. And, and it's easier from my seat now watching and observing and, and having the experience and the history and, and knowing what's going through their minds. And, um, you know, I watched Kershaw come to spring training uh, over to the minor league side a few years ago. And, you know, they were all excited. They brought him over, and he got up and talked in front of 70 minor league pitchers. And, and he says, you know, I just try to throw the ball as hard as I can down the middle. I bet you if you ask him that today, he's probably going to have a different approach and how he's going to utilize his stuff and his game planning and, and how he views him, evaluates himself. And, and uh, it's tough sometimes when you're, when you're in the heat of the moment to, to, to go away from your, your gut instinct and what, what you do best and what you've known you've had success with. And, and you can't be afraid to evolve and you can't be afraid to adjust and, and, and take that chance to, to get better and move forward. Don't forget, guys, if you have questions, if you haven't written them down yet, make sure you do so in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. 
to the back of the room and we'll get those up here in the final 20 minutes of our uh, program here. Uh, the opener. It's a dirty word for some people. Other people think it's a revolutionary idea. You know, uh, what seems to be the climate in terms of people being a little more accepting about this idea? I think the race success probably opened some doors. Um, you know, like players can even see, they're like, wow, that team won that many games, and, and this is part of why the Brewers' uh, success did the same thing. Um, and, uh, and, you know, just doing it more in the minor leagues will get people prepared for this. Uh, and as we, as we sort of figure it out, I think there'll be less of uh, there is definitely some, there are definitely starters who are kind of looking askew at it and, and not really into it. But, um, you know, the more there's success, the more that'll breed open minds about it. Scott, is the idea of an opener a sustainable model over the course of a six-month season? How, how do you manage that? Uh, I would assume if the staff was, was uh, you know, put together and, and that could handle that. We've seen six, we've seen it work. Um, you know, I think I think back of some of the pitching coaches I had when I first signed, and I was in rookie ball. And most of the pitching coaches I had threw on a four-man rotation, and then all of a sudden there was a five-man rotation. So the involvement is is this natural? Um, I just think you have to be smart enough to to understand that it's not a seven-day stretch or a seven-game stretch. You can't go about a, a postseason approach for 162 games. Right. I, I don't personally believe that. Um, but if you had the right bodies and, and you did have uh, the proper mix where guys, you know, can manage some heavier workload and then you got some, some pitchers that might not and then you have the bullpen that, you know, mixes in there, I, I do think it could be sustainable, yes. I think, uh, you know, Kevin Cash in Tampa is saying, okay, we're going to have regular starters for three days and then we'll have openers for the other two because we have three pretty good starting pitchers. Does it simply come down to that, or do you really have to rethink about how you assemble and construct a, a pitching staff? Yeah, I actually asked Farhan Zaidi, the GM for the Giants, about this this offseason at the winter meetings, um, and he said, we were saying, like, is starting pitching devalued now? Because you can do these things, openers and this, and the bullpens, the rise of the bullpen, super bullpens and all this. Um, he said, no, no, every, everybody wants five 200-inning starters. Uh, we just uh, don't think we can get that many. And usually the opener and these other strategies are coping strategies. Uh, they're not necessary, necessarily the optimal thing. So Blake Snell is not going to have an opener. You know? Right. Uh, and uh, it's really something you do when you have a guy that you think um, you could get, you know, you could almost get five innings out if you pick the right five innings. You know, and you just start right after the top four and then st and stop them again before that top four comes back the third time. Uh, so that's, I think that's what it's really about, is like getting, making it as easy as possible for your fourth and fifth starters. I broadcast games occasionally with Randy Johnson, which is an absolute adventure. But Randy uh, is, he has very strong feelings about certain things, and he's very old school about the idea. Uh, and Scott, maybe you can speak to this, that we are training pitchers now not to throw 200 innings and not to throw complete games. We're, we're creating this problem in a sense. Is there anything to that idea? I, I think what Eno said, there, there's always going to be, a, you know, a, a Bob Gibson, a Verlander, a Kershaw. There's always going to be these guys, a Granky, guys that can go deep into a game, and we're not going to take that away from them. Um, it's to aid the, you know, the, the desperation of possibly the, the fourth and fifth guy that, that, that can't. And, and how do we instead of giving those, game, giving those games up, how do we win? And, and what's the best chance of winning on getting those 27 outs on that given day? And, and um, you know, you're talking about a broadcast partner that's used to throwing a nine inning complete game most of the time and would kill somebody if they would take them out. <laughs> I, I get it. Um, I don't know if we're necessarily training to not go deep into the game because we try to instill the mindset of take the ball and go as deep as you can until they take the ball out of your hand. Um, but there is a possibility that guys are starting to look over their shoulder now a little more and, and, and know that there's some help on the way. It seems like fans, and there's all kinds of fan polling taken out there by different television networks, fans want, as you said, they want five starting pitchers. They don't like the idea of the opener. Who's starting tonight? Yeah. Yeah. It, it just, it, 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 I don't think, I think as players are learning to accept it a little bit more, the fans may be the slowest ones to accept the idea, maybe except in Tampa Bay. Yeah, well, I mean, this wins is the bottom line. Well, I do, this is, a, I just had a funny thought about Randy Johnson. Uh, 
So there's two ways this could have gone if Rain Johnson came up right now, right? Uh, maybe he would have had an opener early in his career. Because remember, he was a wild fastball slider guy. Until he was about, yeah, 29 years old, so, until he figured it out. So if he would have come up with an opener, would he have had a better go at it those first four or five years? And then B, would he have le learned the split change that made him you know, who he was later? Or if he had access to the technology, maybe he would have learned it earlier in his career. Yeah, that's true too. Interesting. <laughs> Everything with Randy is interesting. He's, yeah. he's, a, he, he's a character. But what about the idea, Seth, that we're training these guys only to throw five innings and 170 innings a year? Sure. We're, we get the, I guess, kind of ability to not necessarily tell people how to train or what to do, especially when we meet with MLB teams. We uh, will go, and some teams will spend a lot of time with uh, with minor league, major league, front office staff, really going through and trying to educate them on the terms and the technology and how it works and what this looks like. Other teams are a little bit more hands off. Some teams we learn from uh, on that. Most teams we do uh, with that. So I, I think that when it comes down to it on our side, um, when guys are training and, and when they go into the off season, uh, I know that we have two kind of distinct patterns. Some guys um, continue to throw throughout the year. They don't want to get so, uh, you know, I, let their arm get to a point of out of shape. And then we have other guys who don't literally don't pick up a baseball uh, until then that they come back in and then there's a certain time then they start to ramp it up again. Uh, and I, you know, it's again, it's an individualistic thing that uh, I don't think there's necessarily a pattern there and how that uh, will tell you who's going to throw more innings or whatnot. Uh, but at the end of the day, the technology probably is there uh, to create these people with specialized pitches um, that can do that and come in and, and be really effective on certain people and certain players and the statistics can then help you sort of understand and identify matchups and who's going to be able to, um, you know, compete and do well against certain other uh, hitter profiles or pitcher profiles, et cetera. So that, I think, in turn, the technology sort of helps uh, with the idea of having a little bit more specialized pitchers because you get a little bit better understanding of who ultimately can have success. I know an earlier panel talked about almost offensive coordinators and what that did and how you develop game plans uh, for guys. Without the technology behind that, not just Rap Soto, but all of the technology um, there to build and identify the game plan, you know, those sort of things don't really come to life. Steve, what about you? That's an interesting idea that once you get the technology, you get somebody with the, all the, the gizmos hooked up and you look at the data and you look at the video, you're in a sense almost creating somebody, hey, you should create this specialized pitch and suddenly you've got a guy that's got a real weapon on his hands. How is the technology creating that kind of pitcher? Yeah, I think uh, along the same lines, it, 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 the, the data basically gives you a way of, of uh, creating specialized pitchers and, and uh, identifying, uh, you know, certain pitchers that are good in certain s scenarios. So, you know, with, with data, you're able to essentially determine the, the different variables that are important to uh, de determine which, which pitchers are going to do better in certain scenarios versus, versus others. Well, we got a whole bunch of questions here. I want to get to that to make sure we get all of them in. And uh, Evan has written a question for you, Eno. Uh, he says, you've used new statistics like fatigue units in your articles and even pioneered the command plus stat. Where do you see the future of these stats going both in the public sphere and uh, in the uh, proprietary world? Uh, well, you know, I, this is a weird, maybe a weird way to go with it, but um, I'm just a little bit worried about um, the recent news about lineups going straight to MGM or whatever, um, the, uh, the, the, the role of gambling in uh, the availability of data um, concerns me a little bit uh, because some of the stuff that's out there right now that's so cool is because uh, Baseball Savant is out there and allows that data out there. Um, you know, how much, how much is going to be available in the future? Um, I, there was a kind of a startling um, thing for me that, that lineups now, like, and am I allowed to ask a guy if he's in the lineup? You know, am I allowed to tweet out if he's in the lineup? It's a great question. You know, this, this sort of stuff now. Uh, I understand there's a 15, Tori was telling us there's a 15 minute sort of downtime where they send the lineup in and then they release it 15 minutes later. So you, uh, there's that 15 minute window. That's, I guess, how it's supposed to work. So they can get the odds up. Yeah, and then the, the lineup <laughs> is released. But I mean, th that there are implications from that to how much data is going to be available to people to, to make their own uh, sort of stats and to make their own odds and that sort of deal. So there, 
Uh, and I'm always, I guess I'm always nervous about data because I, I want as much data as I can and I'm so jealous of teams for how much data they have and I want all of it and I don't get it. Uh, so I just want more data. What is a fatigue unit? Um, that was actually uh, something, I mean, it, it's been around for a while. Um, I think Randy uh, Jaserly did it at BP first, uh, but my friend, uh, Dr. Mike Sun, has picked it up and tried to use uh, pitch FX and velocity data uh, and usage data for relievers to kind of uh, figure out uh, good patterns for using relievers. One thing that we don't have, the teams have, another data point that I wish I had was like how often they've got hot. You mm -hmm. know, how often did you get that guy up and not get into a game? Because uh, that's something a team could use to do something similar. Yeah, the Diamondbacks track every single pitch everybody throws, whether it's in the bullpen, a warm up, an off day, whatever it is. Every pitch is recorded, so they have all that information. Yeah. Uh, here's a question about roster construction. How would a limit of 11 pitchers per roster uh, affect the idea of the opener in this uh, sort of new climate? Do we need to put a, a limit on the number of pitchers that are available? Anybody? It'd be difficult, uh, you know. You're minus one pitcher. I think average staff now 12, and most a lot of them are 13. Um, you start dipping into the pen a little more, and the usage is going to get a lot heavier, uh, workload heavier over the course of you know a given month or a week. And that'd be really tough to be one guy short unless there was just a revolving door with a lot of guys coming and going. And that's probably what would happen. Well, one of the problems with the game and pace of play we hear from the commissioner's office all the time is, and Tom Verducci has written about this in other times, the idea of bullpen dominance. Bullpens are simply too dominant. Nothing's happening late in the game. They're taking the drama out of it. It's a parade of relievers coming in and out of the bullpen, slows the game down, and then nobody can put the ball in play. Uh, how do we get away from that? Any volunteers? You know, what do you think? What about the idea of bullpen dominance? I, I don't mind. Uh, I don't mind restricting uh, some bullpen decisions. Uh, Mid-inning changes are not, as a viewer, are not uh, always compelling. Um, three batter minimums. That sort of. I don't think that stuff would really change baseball in a uh, in a fundamental way. And I think it might uh, it might shorten uh, games and and you know pitch clock. The pitch clock thing. Uh, I've I've listened to a lot of heated arguments on both sides. Um, and it could actually lead to some, some more injury because um, you, can, you can throw harder if you can spend a little bit more time between each pitch. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so there might be more stress on you. At the same time, uh, one of the largest uh, sort of empty spaces in the game is uh, that sort of the, those moments when the pitcher is walking around the mound and the hitter is asking for time and readjusting, doing the Nomar Garcia para. So. Um, you know, I, I think those moments are not super compelling uh, as a viewer, and if you could cut those moments down, um, even if there were some consequences you had to deal with later, that would be a good idea. Scott, could you have pitched with a, a pitch clock ticking away behind you? Uh, I don't think it would have been a distraction to me. Um, I, I worked fast myself you personally. Were, you know, were I, I try to encourage guys to work, you know, <laughs> at a decent pace. Um, uh, so, yeah, for me personally, I don't think it would have affected me. Steve, here's a, a question for you. Has Kinetrax worked with teams to align the mechanics of different pitchers? Yeah, we're not really privy exactly of what the teams do with the data, but you know that's one useful way of being able to visualize uh, basically aligning two skeletons and being able to determine the differences in the, in the pose. Uh, that, that seems to be one of the best ways to be able to, to visualize and translate what that, the, the information to others in the organization. You can also pan around within the environment, have a complete 3D view, zoom in. Um, there are no cameras above head, so you know you have the ability to get the full 3D reconstruction and synthesize essentially a camera that is pointing directly down onto the pitcher. So you have a lot of unique vantage points uh, that are made available through the data. Seth, how about at Rap Soto? Uh, in which aspect? Uh, in terms of aligning the mechanics of the pitchers. Sure. I, I think that there's always uh, the idea of building kind of benchmarks uh, for guys. And I think the first time a team runs through a rap soda session in the middle of the spring uh, or the beginning of the spring, they're going to get kind of a baseline on a guy and understand where they uh, are going to be. And that's, you know, not to say that everybody with higher RPMs or lower RPMs is going to throw the same. I don't think that's the case at all. Uh, but you just sort of start to understand trends analysis of 
this pitcher may be more adept to being able to be successful with this pitch type uh, and then building that. And then clearly, like we you know mentioned with um, Trevor and what he did uh, over the offseason, and then again uh, this offseason with creating the changeup uh, from that side of things, there's pitchers who I think can be successful at that, but I do think it's much more than – this guy has this amount of RPMs, this amount of velo, and this, um, you know, this amount of spin efficiency on a certain pitch. I'm going to go out and re recreate that mm -hmm. in an afternoon. That's probably not uh, an ideal way to think that you can go about approaching it. You're going to create some physical problems for yourself. Yeah. yeah. This is a really good question for everybody here. Does reduced innings demand lead inevitably to reducing a pitcher's variety in his repertoire? So we're, we're in a sense, training them to throw fewer innings. Does that mean they only need to throw fewer pitchers or pitches? Are we training guys to throw only one or two pitches? You know, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, that's what I was thinking about with Randy. It's like, would he have yeah. learned the splitter? Um, I think uh, maybe certain uh, types of players, but I think uh, I think we're we're breeding more intellectually curious players, more players that will always want to get better, always want to use all the tools. Um, and yes, sometimes the tools say this pitch is no good. Stop throwing it. Uh, but usually the tool, if you have the right humans interacting with the tools and interacting with the players, uh, there's some way forward. Yes, maybe not that type of change yet, but let's try splitter. Uh, and I think there's most, even relievers would love to have another pitch. Even relievers when I talk to them in the spring would love to have another pitch. Uh, just because, you know, you're, you're, you, you can't have them sit something. If you're just a two-pitch pitcher, they're gonna, they can sit one or the other. Um, and if you make it, if you add a little wrinkle, then they can't sit just those two. So I think, uh, I, I, th it is a really good question, but I do think that eventually all pitchers want to add another pitch. Scott, did you find that relievers with the Angels the last few years were basically one or two pitch guys? Traditionally, I think that's general across the board. I mean, the reason most pitchers become relievers is we're one pitch short. Um, you didn't develop that change up or that, that, that breaking ball for a strike. And uh, most relievers had a pretty good arm, you know, good fastball, and, and try to rip the slider or, or something. There really wasn't a specialty uh, until the split came around. Um, everybody's searching for a pitch. And I, I tell you, as a pitching coach, when you're walking around at 4 o'clock watching guys play, play catch, you almost cringe when they're trying to teach each other different things. Like we were talking earlier about, you know, different sizes, different bodies, and, and you know, you can't do this, but he can. And, um, they're always searching. They're always tinkering. They're always searching. They're always trying to find that something new. And um, this information that we're, we're privy to nowadays is, is, is allowing some of that to, to, to help, in a sense, you know, uh, without creating a monster. What about the idea that if you're a starting pitcher now and we only need you to go five innings once a week or so, can he then get away with one or two pitches where maybe 10 years ago he would not have been able to do that? I don't think so. I think uh, I think starting pitcher is going to have usually three to four pitches uh, and, and command them. Um, they're going to get through the lineup a couple times, sometimes three, um, depending on the team and, and their role on that particular staff and, and how they fall into place. Um, but I don't. I don't. There are guys that can do it, but I think it's tough to go out there unless it's really two dominating pitches. I think most starters are going to have three to four pitches. Just on that topic, I think Yanni Chirinos is a, a really interesting pitcher because he has, by all accounts, great stuff in three pitches. But I was looking at why they used the opener on him. Uh, he, I think he can only command uh, two of those pitches. And he's kind of, if you look at what he is against lefties and what he is against righties, he's a two-pitch pitcher against each of them. Um, so that, I think, was kind of why he had the opener and why they tried to limit his exposure to the third time through the order. But even a guy like that isn't going to rest on his laurels and be like, I want an opener forever. So they're working with him on high four seamers, adding that to his what was before like sort of sinker split uh, breaking ball. Uh, and they're so, yeah, everyone's always, and everyone has a knuckleball too. No, yeah. yeah. Every, every infielder, every outfielder, they yeah. all throw them. Have we, uh, will we ever reach a point, or we might be already almost be there, where there's absolutely no way that any starting pitcher will be allowed to face. A, a, a third turn through the order? Are, are we headed there? Are we almost there? Is that going to become an absolute? You cannot do it? Because there's so much data to back up the idea that it's not a great idea with a, a couple of exceptions? I think you still have your horses. You still have, yeah, I mean, there, there's, 
depending on how your week feel, where you're at in the season, how, how the rest of the bodies have been, um, you might need to get that extra three, four, or five outs out of a guy on a given day. And, and yeah. if he's through five innings with 75 pitches, you're going to run back out there. And but if it backfires on them, smart aleck broadcasters will always go, well, he left them the third time through the order. What was he thinking? You can't do that anymore. So there's still some, there's still some room to maneuver in there. I, I mean, think so. There's 162 games. Right. Uh, here's a great question for uh, you, Seth, and for Steve. What are the potential applications for Kinetrax and Rapsodo for defensive training? What about, it doesn't necessarily have to be limited to pitchers, does it? Sure, yeah, we, uh, it's been kind of a fun sort of, uh, you know, we go and meet with all the uh, MLB teams that we have during spring training, and some of them we get to do a little bit of, uh, you know, fun and just kind of trial and error sort of things that a lot of teams are now asking about. From a catcher's point of view, they want a ball uh, to have as much backspin as possible just to be able to carry. Also, we don't want to create a lot of run, uh, so we want as close to a 12 o'clock sort of spin direction uh, that we can get. And so, the you know, being able to use um, the pitching monitor in order to just kind of flip that guy around, point at the catcher, and then be able to pick up some of that, uh, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the way it was built to be, but that's... Uh, what's being asked of it, and the same thing from a long toss standpoint, how do we get into that? So uh, eventually we'll have different placements uh, from a hitting and pitching side of things that you can turn on different modes. It'll be for uh, pitcher, uh, or sorry, position players. You can get, uh, you know, outfield throws, infield throws, et cetera, to be able to capture that data. Uh, on the catcher side, it made it really easy that you're not going to get all the release information because we had to raise um, where we were actually capturing the ball from um, just because the throw is uh, a little bit higher. Uh, but you do get a pretty good profile with that um, or throwing ball look like, uh, and so they get to have you know immediate uh, um, understanding of you know why is my ball tailing? What can I do? How do I get behind it? Uh, it? You know, am I a higher RPM guy? Can I get it there a little bit quicker? What does that look like? Steve, what about uh, applications for Kinetrax? Yeah, I mean, what we have for batter, we have uh, side views of the catcher, so there's the possibility of eventually tracking the catcher. Well, we haven't done any work towards that, and then the outfielders. Uh, essentially tracking them. Uh, we don't have cameras yet, but the goal is to, you know, potentially do that at some point and track the mechanics of, of everyone uh, on the field. Uh, so in terms of just the pitching technology, let's get back to that, because here's a great question. What is the next big breakthrough? Sure, so a, a couple different things um, that, that I think can go into that. Obviously with our, you know, the 2.0 that we just launched, that allows us to get uh, a little bit more of the, um, you know, information on the release uh, parameters of that. And the more and more cameras are going to be able to out there and then we can take, you know, information like Kinetrax from a markerless standpoint and then be able to push that down uh, through different levels. Um, you know, everything can be captured uh, from that. So from a high-speed camera standpoint, uh, we have the option and ability to get additional, um, you know, pitch uh, mechanics and biomechanical uh, information and feedback and then also um, the use to be able to do that from a, a hitter's perspective as well. How about Kinetrax? Uh, yeah, we can, I mean, ultimately marry the, the uh, you know, Rapsodo data with the Kinetrax data. And uh, so essentially what they have is the, the ball flight and we have before that. So that really gives you the entire picture. Um, so uh, I think it's a good technology, complementary technologies that can be used to uh, understand fully the, the, the pitch sequence. Of. Oh, well, that's perfect, because we got a great question about that. How does all the, the technology, the Rapsoda, the Kinetrax, how does that, or how can that be used to optimize pitch sequencing? Seth? Yeah, I think that um, the ability to know what um, the ball's doing as it, as it comes out of the hand and then be able to know from a hitter's point of view uh, what that looks like. Uh, we, we take a part of that uh, from the backside now that we get the release information and know what the ball did, but also know what that looked like uh, as the ball was coming out. So understanding tunneling, uh, we have that sort of built out into the application where you can look at bit different pitches, how they tunnel and work off of each other. Uh, I think that, uh, especially from our analytics team, what we're building out is a big push uh, for us to be able to understand and actually have um, you know, an actual sequence breakdown to say this is the most optimal, effective way that you can go after and attack a hitter is knowing that. Obviously, you don't want that to be too predictive uh, and predictable from a hitter standpoint, but that's a, that's a big push for us. Scott, here's a question that you're probably not going to like. Uh, <laughs> as a pitching coach with the Angels, uh, can you please comment on the Otani situation in terms of his injury? Was it, is that something you were able to see coming at all, or did it catch everyone by surprise? 
Well, I think he had a little bit yeah. of a setback before he even came to the States. Um, what I saw, though, was uh, a special person, a you know, special arm, a special athlete, um, what he was capable of doing and maintaining himself uh, day in and day out. The time he had to devote to each side of his sport was impressive. Um, he's, he's a very strong athlete, um, athletic, obviously. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's disappointing what happened. And I'm, I'm assuming he's going to get through it, and, and we're going to see some special things out of him down the road on both I know sides it, of the ball. It, it's hard to say in terms of a physiological standpoint, but is he going to be able, do you think, to, to perform as a hitter with that type of injury? I don't know but, if it's going to affect him as a hitter. Yeah. Um, you know, being his lead arm, I'm not quite sure if it's going to affect him as a hitter. We'll see. But I, I, from what I saw of him, he's a special person. He's one of a kind. You know, have you been around him at all? No, I've not had the pleasure of talking to him. Okay. Uh, will an opener, we're back to the opener now, and staff construction change completely before we get into collective bargaining, arbitration? How, how does all that factor into contracts? That's a, a pretty loaded question, Eno, but, it, but it's going to come up sooner or later, probably sooner. Well, it's a hugely important question because, uh, you know, one of the things we've seen is this idea that you have a fireman, the Andrew Miller type, that, that gets the, the biggest outs or whatever. And, and yes, holds are in, our, there's like a list of stats that goes into arbitration and holds is on that. Uh, so maybe Andrew Miller had a lot of holds that year. But you can still prove uh, and show, like in retrospect, that saves are worth more uh, in arbitration than any other stat. Um, and yes, you can say, oh yeah, our fireman Josh Hader will get rewarded. But Josh Hader, if Josh Hader had 30 more saves, he'd make more money. Sure. Um, and so that that's meaningful. That's uh, that's gaming the arbitration system in a way, uh, as well as putting your best pitchers in the uh, in the high, highest leverage situations. Uh, so does the arbitration system need to evolve then in terms yes, of the criteria? 100%. It needs to be better. Uh, it needs. It's right now. It's decided by uh, non-subject matter experts. You have people who don't actually know that much about baseball who are deciding uh, arbitration cases. That's weird to me. It's super weird. Actually, I think the whole arbitration system is super weird. So. Um, I would well, just ask Trevor Bauer. Yeah, I would recommend that if they're uh, if the players the players right now are in a situation where they need to reward young players more. They need to shift some of the money towards young players because older players are not getting as much money in the free agency market. If they need to do that, they, they their only leverage other than a strike is to reimagine something, uh, give something big to get something big. Um, and I don't know what exactly that is. Maybe length of contracts. Uh, 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 something on uh, a cap on the length of contracts, um, the restricted free agency, some, some sort of, they have, to, they have to really like ideate. They just rather sit down and be like, let's come up with like three or four crazy ideas. They sound crazy right now, but that's gonna be the only way that they can sort of turn things around. Because I think the system as it is now um, is, is uh, not necessarily rewarding the right players all the time uh, and uh, is, I wouldn't say it's totally broken, but it's, 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 it's trending broken. Yeah, I, I agree. Scott, that's a great big picture question. The system as it's set up now tends to reward older players for what they've done. How do we get to a place where we can figure out a way to reward younger players for what they're about to do? It needs to be weighted toward the younger player, I think, as Eno was saying. We've heard pay to play or uh, um, you know, paid on performance. Um, you know, younger players are obviously making a lot more money than they, they were in the past. Um, Pre-arbitration, guys getting locked into earlier contracts. Uh, they are benefiting a little bit. Um, but as you see the stale and, and, and the guys that are sitting on the shelf right now that don't have jobs, there's, there's a lot of guys that are demanding or, or asking for a lot of money or have a price on themselves, and, and they're still sitting at home. And, and that, that's a part of what we need to fix. And, and How's the younger guy going to make more money? That, that's, that's an older question. That's a good note to end on. Thanks very much.